Okay, so now that we have our dev environment up and running, which can be sometimes a bit tricky, but everyone managed to, that's great. We, we can start uh, looking at the first um, data set API examples. Yeah, as I um, already mentioned, the data set API is the API you would use for batch processing. It's available in Java, Scala, and Python. And today we would just um, show the examples all for, for Java, but the APIs are um, very similar and um, if you understand Java examples, you can translate them easily <coughs> into a Scala or a Python. And also very many uh, concepts are also applicable for the data stream API. Documentation, if you want to read further, is available on the Flink website. So let's start with a first word count example and um, kind of see how the typical workflow would be if you implement a Flink program. So you have uh, the Java uh, main method and um, the first thing you would do to set up a Flink program is um, creating an execution environment which um, kind of um, holds the whole context of, of your program and also from this execution environment you would bootstrap um, the first data set here for example reading a text file and later on you would trigger um, the execution of the program because unless you call execute because the API is very lazy it doesn't doesn't do anything and um, right and for example also if you don't if you don't create a data sync which means you write to, to a file or you emit some output um, nothing will happen um, so Next thing we will do after creating an execution of mind uh, is create the data source, which is um, in this case um, uh, simply reading from a text file and storing um, uh, it in a set of um, strings. And yeah, as already mentioned before, the the you always um, have to specify the types in the Scala API. Actually, this is a bit nicer because it it can infer a lot of the, the types and uh, let make it look a bit less verbose. So um, every time um, you, ex you, you execute an, an operation on, on a data set here, for example, the input data set, and you execute a flat map or group by or reduced group, it returns a, a new data set and um, you can store this new data set in a, in a variable. Mm. So I think everyone of you is probably familiar with, with word count. Um, basically what this does is read, read um, from a text file is a, a series of a sequence of words. Then um, it has these words in a data set. Then it would um, discretize the, 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 the words, uh, the text into individual words using a flat map grouped by um, uh, identical words and um, reduce um, the words which are the same to count the words. So um, we, we can look at how these um, operations are actually implemented uh, on the next uh, slides. Um, so for example, to implement a, a flat map function, you would have to create uh, a class which um, implements this interface, flat map function. Then you would uh, specify also the input and the output data type of the, uh, of the operation, which in this case is just um, a string for, for the text which flows in and a tuple um, cont containing a word and uh, its occurrences, in this case um, the word and one, um, as an output. And uh, yeah, the way this works is here in the, in the method, in the implemented method, method where you split up um, the text into words in an in, in array and then for every word you actually emit a tuple uh, containing the word and one. 
And after that, you reduce this new data set, you, you group by all, um, the, the word keys, and you reduce um, the data set by, with this group reduce function, which takes um, the, the word and the one tuples as an input, um, and all of them, which also the identical, so if there would be two words, uh, two hellos in, in the text, then you would receive hello one, two times, and you would basically iterate over these, um, the values you receive, and then um, keep track uh, of the number of occurrences using count variable, increment this variable, and return uh, the reduced um, tuple, which will contain the word count results. So is that, does that make sense for you? Okay. Right. Um, so, let me um, go over a few more um, concepts of the dataset, dataset API. We have, you already seen, we, we, can, we can use with the basic Java types, which are, um, yeah, strings, longs, integer, boolean, whatever, and the um, array variants of them too. But we can also um, create compositive types, which there are quite a number of, but actually we just use tuples here, and tuples are a very nice way in Flink to, to um, encapsulate data. Um, so the way you create it is just uh, create this, for example, tuple two with first and the last name, or even tuple three or four, and if you want to access the fields, then you just um, specify um, the object dot f zero F or F one, uh, just be sure that um, the first element's always uh, the zero element, like uh, in arrays. Um, then the, the basic uh, transform, there's, what's the question? Sorry. Yes, they're, no. Well, no, you, well, no, they actually can be reused, you're right. Uh, <laughs> um, but, Then the one of very simple um, transformation is the map. Um, Flink imp implements two kind of uh, map functions. It's a kind of traditional uh, map where you just uh, receive a value and transform it and emit uh, another value but um, of the same type. So here, for example, we receive a list of integers and multiply them by two. And in contrast to that, we have the, the flat map, which is a kind of more general implementation of a map, which can receive actually an input and an output type, and it doesn't have to be the same. So here, we do the same as the traditional map by collecting um, the values uh, here by multiplying, multiplying the <coughs> integers by two. But you could also, um, for example, call out.collect two times and emit multiple results there. So it's a bit different. Then there's the, the filter function, which lets you um, apply a filter on a data set. For example, here we again have the integer um, data set and we filter out all elements which are not, uh, which are um, equal to uh, three. So, yeah, if this returns a true, then um, actually the, um, the value is kept and otherwise not. So here we just filter out the three. Then um, we have groupings and reduce. Um, like we, we saw that already in the word count example, but I'm gonna demonstrate it here again to make it clear. So if we have, for example, a data set with um, a name and an age of, of a person, um, then 
um, we can group by, for example, if, if we represent it as a tuple 2 of name and age, we can group by, for example, the age here and reduce um, actually the, the um, reduce with this function count same age, which will uh, give, us a, give, us a, give us a list of um, people who are in the same age group. So here we can see um, we have Julia and Romeo um, uh, at same age, and actually Anna and Stefan are also in the same age, and um, so that's why the output here is 18.2 and 27.2. And yes, and the reduce function which counts the same age looks um, like this. So you would receive um, the name and the age and you would uh, output um, the age group and the number of people in this age group. Yeah, and this is, I think, very simple function here, similar to the word count example. Flink also supports um, joins, which uh, are, are similar from joins you, you know from uh, SQL based systems. Um, actually these, those joins are um, equi joins, if you know what that is. That uh, means that um, that we we actually will will match only the two um, two data sets which have um, which match on on some condition and leave out all the other elements. I'm going to demonstrate it here for you, uh, if that if that's not clear. So we typically um, have um, in some fancy web application, for example, have some. Uh, some lists, a table of authors and um, a post table and here in, in the author table we would store an ID for each author and for each post someone makes we store the author ID. So we can represent these two tables using uh, two data sets in Flink with um, one the authors with a tuple 3 and also the post with a tuple 3 which just contains this data. And um, what we could do now, um, for example, if we wanted to get a list um, with authors and uh, all the posts they wrote, we could join these two tables. So we would um, see here, for example, that uh, Fabian with, is, is the author of, of this post. So. And we want to get a list. So we join the authors with uh, the post data set and actually um, match only if we um, find an ID, so this is why it's a zero here, which um, matches the author ID here in the post data set. And yeah, this is what the uh, result would look like. So um, we um, get actually because we didn't specify like how exactly the join should be performed, we get a tuple two with both data sets uh, where they matched. And you can see here what I wanted to demonstrate to you about joins that, for example, Max here, he's uh, in the authors list, but um, he didn't write an, uh, a post, so um, he actually does not appear in the um, results because it's, um, it's an equi-join. Yeah, you can also specify actually a join function, which is here, this, this interface join function, which um, actually lets you re specify the output type. So you might only want to put out um, name and title and not um, like we had here, the, the whole two um, data set um, columns. So here you would um, return, you would specify um, the join function here with posts by user and here in the join function you would then emit just only um, the, the name and the title from the two data sets. Yes? Sure. 
Sure. You can you can use case classes, and you you could also use Java pojos or Java objects. Yeah. Um, it looks very similar. I just wanted to keep it simple for this example. Yeah. We, we covered it also in the advanced um, tutorial later on. So, um, yeah, for data sources, um, we have this read text file and uh, read CSV file, and we can directly create um, um, also a data set from collections and elements. Uh, just a brief demonstration again. So here from elements takes, for example, just a list of strings, and then you have a data set of strings. Or you could also create an array list where you add some uh, strings to it and uh, create a data set using the from collection method. So um, that's very, sim uh, very handy for um, trying out programs without reading from a file. And then, but there are also the file-based ones where you, for example, just read from a simple file or you might um, write, read from a CSV file which is um, somehow separated, comma separated. You can specify that standard, I think, is, is a comma separated file. And you, but then you have to, of course, annotate the, the class, uh, the types um, using um, this um, types uh, method because otherwise Flink wouldn't know how to interpret the values in the CSV file. And you can also use the include fields method on uh, read CSV file to specify like a mask which um, allows you to include or exclude um, fields from the CSV. So here would include the first and the uh, fourth element but leaving out all the others, other columns. Similarly, we have the, the data things, which um, also allow you to write as text or as CSV. And we also have special methods which allow you to, uh, to get back, actually, the results of a data set um, to, to your program. So basically, because the data set is always an abstraction of a parallel collection, but if you would use, for example, collect, you would get back the, um, the actual data. That can sometimes be helpful. Yes. Sure. Usually, you would you would persist from the executing nodes, um, because it's always some overhead to return actual uh, data set to the client, yeah. Um, like writing to a database? No, no, I mean executing on each node I mean, if you want to, want to write to a file, you would um, have this write, write as text or, the, or write, write to file, and it, it actually outputs on, on the worker. And if you use HDF. There, there are actually many ways to um, output data. You can also create your own um, output format if you have some special way of persisting your data. Um, yeah. But we can talk about it later. <coughs> um, so by default, data things are always executed lazily, which means otherwise you execute, when you trigger the execution, they, they won't actually um, do anything. 
Um, but as I mentioned, um, there are also those, those eagerly executed data things, which, which means once you call, actually print or count or collect, you will actually get um, a ba back the, the parallel data set materialized. Here would get the count of uh, the number of elements back. Here we would immediately print on, on your client or collect would return you the, the actual parallel data set um, data. Yes, and to conclude, we have some, some um, advice for you. Uh, what is really handy if you use the from elements or from collections function to, get in, to quickly um, insert some data in your program. So before you, um, for example, read from a big file, you would just uh, create a sample data set before and, and then use, for example, the print method to um, quickly print it or like the count collect I mentioned in the previous slide. And also what you can do is if you transform an operation like map or reduce, you can actually uh, call uh, reduce on a data set and then name and give it a, um, give it, specify a string here and give it a name so you can quickly identify um, the output in the logs if, if there's some, some error during execution. So that's it already. Do you have any questions?